Hello, I'm Jim Caldwell, and thank you for joining me for Wayne Tebow in his own words. Wayne Tebow has recently painted this wonderful cover for the August 17th New Yorker. On November 15th, he will celebrate his 100th birthday. Wow, what a milestone. Tebow says, Almost all of us start out as painters and experience the thrill of painting things. Big, beautiful red smears, flowers and apple trees, shining suns, butterflies and bugs, mom with a huge head, and sometimes something out of our own heads. With these early works, we have our first exhibition at the legendary Refrigerator Gallery. He continues, It is hard to know why any one of us would ever give up such a pleasurable and intriguing thing to do. So some of us never stop, because we have seen the many painted miracles we have inherited from the masters, and we have fallen in love with painting. Thank you for looking at my pictures." Unquote. This wonderful quote tells us a lot about this fascinating artist. His humility, Thibault calls himself a painter, not an artist. He calls them pictures, not paintings. His sense of humor and his childlike joy in the act of painting. At 99, he's still painting and exploring the visual world around him. As a gifted and articulate teacher and academic, he has thoughtfully spoken about his paintings in many interviews over his long career, so that whenever possible, I have expressed the presentation of his extraordinary body of work in his own words. I will usually start each image with a quote. In the next 50 minutes, we will look at three very different themes which Thibault has explored during his prolific 60-year degree, 60-year career. Still lives, figures, and landscapes, which in turn are in three groups, the city groups, the Sacramento Delta, and Memory Mountains. As a coda, we will look at a subject of his latest show, The Clowns of His Youth. As different as they are in spirit, all three groups are easily recognized as coming from the mind and hand of the same artist. It is tempting to think that each of these themes represents a different stage of Thibault's life, yet we will see that all of these motifs have been intermingled in his long career. His genius lies in his ability to combine apparent opposites, such as representation and abstraction, similarities and dissimilarities, humor and anxiety, tight control and lack of control, as well as his fertile imagination and, above all, the delicious application of beautiful, bright colors on canvas. We will come back to all of these paintings. With each of these groups, I have placed the paintings in chronological order. But we need to start with a thumbnail sketch of Thibault's early years. He was born in Mesa, Arizona on November 15, 1920. The following year, the family moved to Long Beach, California, where he spent his youth. When he was 16, he spent the summer in the apprentice program of the Walt Disney Animation Studio. The following summer, he studied commercial art and for the next few years took odd jobs as a sign painter, freelance cartoonist, and illustrator. During World War II, he served in the U.S. Air Force as an artist and cartoonist. All of these experiences had an obvious impact on his mature style. After the war, he got his teaching credential at San Jose State, although he never had any formal training in drawing or painting. In his 30s, he taught at Sacramento City College, and Sacramento has been his home ever since. When he was 31, he was given his first one-man show at the Crocker Art Gallery in Sacramento. When he was 36, he took a leave of absence from his teaching job and went to New York for a year to study abstract expressionism. He supported himself as an art director for two ad agencies. He made some important connections, including a friendship with the abstract expressionist Willem de Kooning, 16 years his senior. Quote, de Kooning told me, you should find something that you really feel is genuine in terms of your experience. All the influence of the, of the art world can trip you up. It is not so important to be interested in what's happening today. Thibault adds, this made a big impression on me. At 39, he married Betty Jean Carr, 
his second wife, who was to become his model and his lifelong muse. In 1960, they honeymooned in Mazatlan. That year, they had a son whom they named Paul. That trip to Mexico was a significant turning point in his painting style. Before Mexico, Thibault had been fascinated with the shop windows of Manhattan. His colors were mostly earth tones applied with a small brush. The subjects were out of focus, the colors muddy. He said, I felt sort of embarrassed by the fact that I had subject matter in there, so I tried to cover it up with arty strokes and expressive lines and so forth, unquote. He was drawn to the opulent handling of paint applied to, to, to totally representational, to representational subject matter, as were David Park and his friend Richard Diebenkorn, members of the Bay Area figurative movement. And this was after Mexico. This is a beach scene in Mexico painted from memory. The changes in his style are dramatic. As Thibault explains, it was apparent to me when we came back from Mexico that not only had the lights at night changed, but there was a general glittery activity on all sides. There was more chrome, more reflected light, more flags waving. When one went into a place to eat, the speed and tempo were much greater the light sources were much larger. The flamboyance, the energy was omnipresent. We only noticed this after we had gone to a slower paced community." Unquote. We can see that in a very short time, his colors had become brilliant and he had gained the confidence to apply his heavy pigments with a big brush. The subject is coming into sharper focus. The red and orange highlights in the shop sing out against the blue of the sky and the clear, bright golden sand. Thibault had spent part of his youth as a lifeguard on the beach. And soon this. Thibault says, I took three basic shapes to work with, a rectangle, an ellipse, or a circle, and a triangle. Well, that is a piece of pie. A piece of pie is a triangle on a saucer. I chose a pie for a couple of reasons. Because of its basic shape, and because I had never seen pie painted. I thought to myself, Jesus, this will be the end of me. Nobody is going to take me seriously, but I couldn't leave it alone. One thing that allowed me to do that was having been a cartoonist." Unquote. In April of 1962, when Thibault was 42, his career went from zero to 60 with one show at the Allen Stone Gallery in New York. It was the right place and the right time. Less than a year before, he had shown the same pie paintings in San Francisco and had sold none. Alan Stone was a trusted dealer. New York was the epicenter of the international art world at the time, and artists like Andy Warhol were rejecting abstract expressionism with a Campbell soup can. The show sold out, and museums were buying Thibault pies for their permanent collections. Wow! Buyers included Alfred Barr, the Museum of Modern Art, and the architect Philip Johnson. Alan Stone became his lifelong dealer. Thibault's pies and cakes were novel, new, fresh, and irresistible. Quote, I depend on line a great deal. My pictures are painted and drawn in several intense hues, one over the other, to make them as lively and as strong as possible. Later on in painting, I may obliterate them in part or repaint them as needed." Unquote. Thibault called this halation, a term he borrowed from photography, meaning the fog around the bright edges of a photograph. He meant halation as the vibrating effect of bright complementary colors reacting to each other. In the lower right, we can see red, orange, and green. In the upper left corner of the pie, we can see tight control and lack of control, what I call a happy accident when the paint pigments mix on the canvas in an uncontrolled way. That is what happens when the brush is heavily loaded with different colors of pigment. I'm sure Thibault said to himself, I like it, so I'm going to leave it. The genius is knowing when to leave it. He also is interested in the negative spaces, where the space is left over or around an object, like the semicircle on the plate to the right of the pie. I will be using the terms negative spaces and happy accidents again. Quote, 
At present, I'm painting still lives taken from window displays, store counters, supermarket shelves, and mass-produced items. I try to find things to paint which I feel have been overlooked. It seems to me that we are self-conscious about our still lives without good reason." Unquote. I love this one for its cool wateriness, its seemingly casual but controlled blue-white background which has been buttered on with a big brush. The perfect red-pink of the watermelon is in contrast with the black seeds, the interesting negative spaces and the curious red object in the foreground. Is that a reflection or an object with which to cut the melon? For obvious reasons, many critics placed him with a pop artist like Warhol and Lichtenstein. But their flat handling of paint with silkscreen and stenciled edges, images, their pop culture subjects, and a preoccupation with signage is so different. Quote, I simply wanted to get objects to sit well in space. I wanted to orchestrate space. Impasto is employed for the specific purpose for a specific purpose. It alludes to the tradition of illusionistic painting. In my case, an experiment with what happens when the relationship with, between the paint and the subject matter becomes as close as I can get it. White, gooey, shiny, sticky oil paint spread on a, the top of a painted cake becomes frosting. It's playing with reality. Painting is where the artist is like a magician. I would like to show my hand and expose the trick. Unquote. Impasto, the very heavy application of paint, is typical of so many of Thibault's paintings. Notice the red-hot edges which bring this white-on-white -white composition to life. The cool blue cast shadows are so prominent in his work. Here they are in contrast with the lighter blue of the shaded side of the cake. Thibault says, most of the objects are fragments of actual experience. For instance, I would really think of the bakery counter, of the way the counter was lit, where the pot pies were placed. From when I worked in restaurants, I can remember seeing rows of pies or a tin of pie with one piece out of it and one pie sitting beside it. Those little vedute in, in fragmented circumstances were always poetic to me. He continues, painting a row of cakes suggests some rather obvious notions about conformism mechanized living, and mass-produced culture. In addition, there are some surprising things which are present. How alone, how alone these endless rows can be, a kind of lonely togetherness. Each piece of pie or donut has a heightened loneliness of its very own, given, giving it uniqueness and specialness in spite of its regimentation." Unquote. We can only get a tantalizing hint of the decorated cake in the top row. The two loaves of bread, with their warm reflected light on the shaded sides, are important to the composition as they make the negative space around the displaced case so much more interesting. Quote, Lately I have used a kind of head-on directness, placing the object somewhere near the middle of the canvas format in a plain or simple background. Why must pies always be cut so precisely? Why not just scoop a helping out with a spoon? They have to be cut clean, and they have to continue to stand up and maintain their shapes after being cut. Bakery goods are glorious. I'm in pursuit of the kind of painting in which I am most interested, painting that is representational and abstract simultaneously." Unquote. Notice the pie's beautiful simplicity and subtlety of color the implication of a smile with the edge of the pie tin, the reflected light on the left side of the pie, and the implied right edge of the pie which has been painted in the same value as the background. Quote, my procedure varies. I have worked from the actual objects, from photos I have taken, from commercial advertising photographs, and from memory. This last one, memory, has been my main one during recent years. My time spent as an advertising art director, cartoonist, and illustrator some years ago are partially responsible for the look of some of the things." Unquote. Notice that the rainbow of gumballs appears to be suspended in fluid with no distracting glass reflections. 
the hot edges of the counter vibrate, vibrate with halation. Quote, I have always exhibited in the pop art shows, but I don't see myself as being in any way central to that category. Pop art became a simultaneous, uh, became a stimulus for art writers to express what they felt about what was happening in the world. They wrote that the pop art is concerned with social alienation, with a society amidst mass-produced goods, cheap, ordinary, and banal objects. I, on the other hand, celebrate Coca-Cola signs as beautiful objects." Unquote. Pastel, or oily sticks of chalk, is another medium which Thibault has mastered so brilliantly. Like with the cakes, he's having fun with simple geometric shapes, which are similar yet dissimilar, the negative spaces and the subtle color variations of the lipsticks. I love the dramatic rich black shadows and the reflections of the on the metallic shafts. With no context, he's playing with the scale like sculptor Klaus Oldenburg. Thibaut says, the tradition of sustaining the picture plane interests me right now. My surfaces are activated and brushed heavily to try to keep them visually available. The space inference that I want is one of isolation, ultra clear, bright, air conditioned atmosphere that might be sort of stirred up around the objects and echo their presence. For this reason, uninterrupted single colored backgrounds are used, and this allows the brush marks to be seen more clearly and play their role." Unquote. I love the reflected light on the right sides of the scoops of ice cream and the happy accidents which occur when Thibault applies the pigment so heavily. Quote, when I speak of commercial art techniques, I don't mean the technical processes, but the process of envisioning an image as a whole. Pop artists were going for the technical processes. For the first time, I felt comfortable. I worked freely on a thing that in the past I had worried about intensely. It was a joy to find release. Common objects become strangely uncommon when removed from their context and ordinary ways of being seen." Unquote. Notice how Thibault kisses the edge of the picture with a shadow of the tape, the tip of the screwdriver, the globe of the light bulb. Look at the complexity of colors he has painted in the threads of the light bulb, and the luminous shadow of the yellow lucite handle, and the interesting negative space created to the right of it. The geometric simplicity of this random collection of objects is breathtaking. The dates on these last five still lifes indicate that he painted them long after he had moved on to other motifs, but in that way makes but it, but in no way that in no way makes them less interesting. This pastel has always appealed to me. The scale which Thibault has created is fascinating. It has the weight of a Mayan temple and could be a, could be huge with its tiny wedding couple perched on top and elaborate decorations. I love that the ground fades from pale yellow in the front to a soft blue in the back, creating a depth of space which is usually lacking in his still lives. The rich layering of the pastels in the shadows is wonderful. Quote, I don't think I'm much of a colorist. My main interest is with contrasts of great intensity. This effect exemplifies the idea of starkness and glare that I'm trying for. So I don't think much about color in terms of hue. I think that Thibault is selling himself short, as color plays such an important role in his work from the blue icing to, to the rich chocolate browns to the lavender shadows to the hot halation. Again, the lack of scale he has created by eliminating all reference to place is so fascinating. It's as if we could wander around these giant cakes. Quote, the symbolic aspect of my work is always confusing to me. It's never been clear in my, in my mind. I tend to view the subject matter without trying to be too opaque with respect to its symbolic reference." Unquote. Here, Thibault has switched to a dark background so that the brilliant candied apples appear to be on fire. The, the bright yellow stick handles are intentionally set off at casually odd angles, and perspective has been intentionally ignored as the black apples 
as the back apples seem larger than the front ones. This is such a powerful painting. Without a context and without the powerful, uh, and with the powerful darks, these cans loom large. Thibault is playing off the cylinder of the can with a reverse curve of the white reflections. We don't know what is reflected in the right can, but the shapes are interesting. These upside down ice cream cones with clown makeup added are placed as if a child had dropped them. We can almost hear the crying child demanding replacements as the clowns in their dunce caps contemplate their fate like snowmen in the hot sun. Thibault painted these almost 20 years ago, and yet they are already suggesting the clown paintings we shall explore at the end of this show. Let's go back to 1964, when Thibault was 44. As much as he enjoyed his newfound wealth and reputation, he needed to embark in a new direction. Thibault said, it's not so much fun being known as the pie man, so I decided to concentrate on figures for a while. I think an artist's capacity to handle a figure is a great test of his abilities." Unquote. At this point, he was teaching at UC Davis, and the university granted him a one-year sabbatical so he could explore the human figure. Thibault met on a weekly basis with a group of artist friends with whom he shared model expenses in a life drawing studio in San Francisco. He says, the biggest achievement and richest gift of drawing is not the drawing, but the new eyes that it gives you, because it teaches you how to see in a way that you can't see otherwise." Unquote. I love the shadow wrapping around Mallory Ann's leg, the reflected light on that leg, and the sensitive rendering of her intense gaze. Quote, staring at something that stares back at you does something to the visual field. Unquote. Mallory Ann is his daughter by his first wife, Patricia. I just, quote, I decided to express myself in a way that was different from the period in which I painted pies and cakes. I began to use very strong light bulbs in my studio, which illuminated a subject in some ways like the sun. It's like seeing a stranger in some place like an air terminal for the, for the first time. You look at him, you notice his shoes, his suit, the pin in his lapel, but you don't have any particular feeling about him, unquote. The critics were not particularly kind to Thibault's new motif, claiming that they were failures as portraits, but he always thought of them only as figures, a sort of human still life. Unlike this, the depiction of food, which was mostly done from memory, these large figures were painted from life. This one is an exercise in severe foreshortening, as we can see in the man's legs and the shoes, which are in reality much longer than they appear on the canvas. Thibault is just as interested in the wooden spindles of the chair, which he renders so carefully, and the negative spaces between them, as well as the shadows on the man's back. Thibault says, erotic paintings are pictures of vulnerability, for when we are in love with anything or anyone, we are exposed. The object of our love must seem available. We tend away from the deep freeze ice cream cones and chilling nudes, the ice cream must be in a state of softness so that we may taste the flavor and the body must be exposed and ready for love." Unquote. This is his wife, Betty Jean, with whom he was definitely in love. This unusual painting stands apart from all of the other figure paintings he did. It is full of con contradictions. Her spread leg pose is suggestive and yet the prominence of her soles of her bare feet is anything but sexual. Her blank stare hints at a mind which is far away from the scene. This painting is really about skin and all of its subtle colorations. There is lots of lovely reflected light on the left leg and the right arm. It is also a study in foreshortening with the legs in the right hand, which is so perfectly rendered. Here we see the beautiful happy accidents in the lower left of the triple scoop as he butters on the heavy pigment. Ice cream, with all its suggestive and sensual implications, has been a favorite subject of many of his still lives, like the New Yorker cover. Betty Jean's parted lips are anticipating the cool sweetness of this scoop. Thibault says, one of the problems with 
was to, in some way, devise a painting of a person in a bathtub that did not look too much like the David painting of Marat. I recall that at one point I had her arm hanging out of the bath, unquote. Here again is Betty Jean. This painting is fascinating in its simplicity, its proportions, the focus on halation with the red and green lines at the bottom, the suggestion of his wife's naked body hidden by the tub, the drama of her dark hair set against all that white, the detachment of her blank stare and slightly downturned mouth, a moment of inexplicable evocativeness. Quote, drawing to me is a kind of inquiring research that painting rests upon. I have drawn all my life, unquote. When Thibault did this powerful drawing, he was still doing life drawing with his friends 18 years after he drew Mallory Ann. Unlike the one of his daughter, he has not bothered to finish the face of the sitter because he is more interested in the bold forms of the male body illuminated by a strong light. I particularly like his rendering of the model's hands and the rich multiple hatchings on the right leg. In 1973, because he was visiting San Francisco quite frequently, Thibault bought a small cottage in the Potrero Hill District south of downtown. This neighborhood has something, some of the steepest streets in the city, and soon he became fascinated with how they might fit into his abstraction reality fact-fantasy dichotomy. Quote, the street pictures, which I did in San Francisco, they came out of Dick Diebenkorn's Berkeley series in his street scenes, unquote. While Diebenkorn's streetscapes are serious, Thibault's scenes make us smile at their crazy implausibility. He jokes, once I had set up my easel on a San Francisco street, a man stopped to watch and said to me, you could spend just a short time in an art school and get that perspective thing worked out, unquote. This scene is clearly the 280 Southern Extension with Cesar Chavez Street at the bottom of the hill, and yet Thibault is already distorting the perspective of the four-lane street, which should be getting much narrower as it goes off into the distance, and surely exaggerating the steepness of the street in the foreground with the car looking like it's about to drive off a cliff. And such a wonderfully, it is such a wonderfully rich drawing with a full range of darks and lights. This new direction did not at first appeal to the critics. Quote, My work does seem to change, but it's a cyclic change in a number of ways. It's a tightrope walk between the development of a con convention that seems to answer a problematic demand and the need to avoid a formula that devitalizes my work. Unquote. In this one, we can't see the facades of the right side of the street except for the wonderful shapes of carefully rendered blue shadows. To flatten the picture plane, Thibault has purposely distorted the perspective of the street, which should be getting much narrower, and, and tipped it giddily to the left as it approaches the intersection, which should be flat. He has also exaggerated the vertiginous effect of the hill falling away to the left, here, his red edges highlight a no parking zone at the corners. The arrow indicates a one-way street coming up the hill, our worst nightmare in a stick shift. The richness of Thibault's palette is wonderful. Thibault says, <coughs> painting itself is a kind of miracle because what you're doing is reducing a three-dimensional world of living, active, organized chaos into this little, unmoving, quiet, flat thing which has to be able to speak." Unquote. Here, Thibault has abandoned perspective entirely, as the street seems to be getting wider as it goes up the hill. What a rich painting this is, with the red at the bottom balancing the green as its complement at the top. The dark asphalt balanced by the plain white sidewall, and the electric lines creating an interesting fine texture at the bottom half of the painting. The geometry of the buildings in the lower right is completely skewed. In these buildings, Thibault has abstracted reality. We can just make out his hot red edges at the bottom. The tiny cars are completely out of scale. Thibault states, 
This is the happy side of taking on actual confrontation with the world, where you sit down and look at it and draw a lot, but then in the studio, the artist is orchestrating forms." Unquote. From the straight lines of the arbitrary street grid imposed on the difficult hills of San Francisco, we go to the sinuous, elevated freeways, which no longer respect the street grid. At first glance, this scene looks quite plausible, albeit more like the complex freeway interchanges of Los Angeles. But then we notice the stadium in the right center of the image, which is totally out of scale. Then we realize that this painting is completely a figment of Thibaut's fertile imagination. Thibaut says, I didn't go to art school. I came up through the ranks of cartooning and illustration and graphic design where I learned by apprenticeship the great traditions of design and typography and the decorative arts, the ideas and practices of design and drawing." Unquote. There is a definite sinister quality to this one, which Thibault did a dozen years after he started the City Series. He has abandoned all hints of reality. It's a fascinating combination of an urban scene with the Magic Mountain series, which we will see in a few minutes. Now the massive dark hillside in the middle looks like it's been sheared off to reveal an inner earth glowing with red hot magma. I particularly love the composition of the buildings perched on the peak, the rich texture of the apartment facade in the back, and the hopelessly clogged freeway suspended in space wrapping around the left edge. I am very influenced, quote, I am very influenced by the tradition of painting and not at all self-conscious about identifying my sources. I actually just steal things from people that I can use, just blatant plagiarism." Unquote. Thibault's favorite artists include Chardin, Sargent, Vermeer, Mondrian, Hopper, and Diebenkorn. This comment seems to me to be totally self-deprecating, as I think Thibault's work is in no way derivative of anyone. He is a school of one. So far, I've shown you a few pastels, but this is the first watercolor, and I think it's very beautiful. At first glance, it seems pretty straightforward, with a street wrapping around the right edge to a beach with a conventional horizon at the top. But then we begin to realize that it is, it is as spatially complicated as an M.C. Escher, with apartments rising out of the street, which seems vertical and a group of, the, of buildings in the upper left which do not converge on the horizon as they should. Like Sargent's watercolors, he has combined the loose washes in the lower left with the delicate details of the impossible urban scene fading off in the upper quarter of the painting. Thibault says, some of my landscapes have to do with longing and yearning for something unattainable. The urge to reach heights and build a fantasy world, and some have to do with the loneliness of the streets." Unquote. The last of the cityscapes I'm going to show you is Park Place, which is as wildly vertiginous as anything Thibault has painted. The rolling street at the bottom looks like it's dropping into an impossibly deep chasm, hitting a street with no perspective until it gets to the very top, disappearing over the hill. The blank yellow sidewall of the apartment building imitates the shape of the street, except it has horizontal lines instead of vertical ones. Notice the richness of the extremely foreshortened apartment facades and the impossibly tiny cars. The green cliff on the left, with its thin edge of vegetation on the top, is something dark and ominous we will see again in his memory mountains. Thirty years ago, Thibault decided to add yet another motif to his repertoire, the meandering waterways of the Sacramento Delta, and the colorful patterns of the rich farmlands planted behind the levees. This is an area very near where he has spent most of his life. I have not seen it documented, but I think he was inspired by a helicopter ride, as I was. From the ground, it is impossible to understand or appreciate the rich and wonderful patterns, colors, and textures which one can see from the air. In this series, he's using a much brighter palette of colors. He says, I wanted to eliminate the horizon line to see if I could get a landscape image that didn't use a horizontal fixation. 
to try to get some sense of the loss of the convenience or comfort of standing and looking at things, to throw people off a bit, unquote. He has definitely thrown us off and gotten our attention by creating multiple vanishing points or parallel lines seeming to converge in different directions, the land and the water no longer lie flat. And he has juiced up the colors so that they dance off the canvas as the river splits the painting in two. Quote, I would like the painting to create its own light, to create its own energizing forces, to express metaphorically with the use of color the same sort of light energy that reflects off natural objects, unquote. The radiant yellow glow Thibault has painted in the center, like looking through Venetian blinds in the bright sun, the hot trees in the foreground, the delicate vertical details and their cast shadows, and the beautiful mix of hot and cool colors at the top are magical. It is as if the land bends up at the straight line of the river behind the trees and then flattens out again at the top. What a fascinating spatial effect he has created. Of all the paintings in this show, I think this is my favorite. Let's have a closer look at the beautiful shapes, hot, cold colors, and the fine details of the trees and their shadows at the top of this painting. Notice the tiny farm workers in the field at the top, which he has added with his smallest brush. Speaking of his grandfather's farm in Southern California, Thibault said, I plowed, harrowed, dug, and hitched up teams, and planted and harvested alfalfa, potatoes, and corn. I loved it. It was a great way to grow up. These paintings have something to do with the love of that, unquote. The stunning colors of the orchards on the left and the trees on the right remind me of the brilliant stained glass windows of Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The transition of bright yellow to peach in the river is masterful. Note that the converging perspective lines in the green field on the right center have created a whole other spatial vignette within this painting. In this vaguely whale-shaped reservoir, Thibault has so delicately transitioned from yellow to lavender, and the halation is now in the curving crop rows at the bottom, with a full rainbow of colors. The intense dark of the whale's mouth sets off all of the pastel colors and textures. Curiously, in the upper left, there is a separate converging perspective vignette using the same horizon line, which is pressed to the top of the canvas. The reflections of the trees and house play off against the shadows coming from the right. Let's go back to 1962, when Thibault was 42. At the same time he was painting pies, he was laying the groundwork for his abiding interest in landscapes with this early mountain study. When he showed it to the New York dealer, Alan Stone said, my God, I've just gotten used to, I've gotten people used to your pies. Thibault was strongly counseled against painting landscapes which were out of fashion at the time. His response was to double down on his efforts. He said, quote, one, one critic thought, as many people think, that they are invented forms, that they are esoteric or even arcane surrealist references, but they are not that at all. They're painted right on the spot. I think people aren't used to seeing things cut from corner to corner so rudely or crudely, and maybe it's upsetting or seems unfulfilled in the sense of space. It's, it is something, that, nonetheless, that fascinates me. It came about by driving across the country and actually going through those canyons. Those imposing structures seem to just fall in on you and make such a nice visual shape that I, I can't resist doing them. Unquote. This beautiful pastel does have the look of an on-location study of real formations, and pastel is a handy medium for that, as it is so portable and immediate. Yet it, it also has two elements which we will see repeated many times in his later Memory Mountain series. Thibault likes to start his composition in the upper corner, in an, in an upper corner and end it in the opposite lower corner. There is also a large area of rich darkness with red highlights, which appears again and again in his later series. We have already seen this in two of his cityscapes. Thibault says, 
I'm not just interested in the pictorial, pictorial aspects of the landscape, seeing a pretty place and trying to paint it, but in some way to manage it, manipulate it, or see what I can turn it into." Unquote. He finished this beautiful painting the following year. It definitely has the look of one done on sight, with a fresh immediacy and many happy accents of pigment mixed on canvas, as he rushed to finish it before the light had changed. Notwithstanding the blues on the left with a streak of red, it does not yet have the brooding dark areas of the memory mountains to follow. Quote, my, my project was to look at all the dark paintings done by many great artists, including Rembrandt, Goya, Whistler, and Balthus, trying to see what kind of mood I could create, unquote. These cotton ball backlighted clouds fascinate Thibault and appear in a number of his paintings. With the sun behind them, they could not possibly be casting a shadow on the deep purple face of the cliff, yet the effect is striking. When I first saw these large paintings in person, I was quite overwhelmed by their power and moodiness. Here again, we see his preferred compositional conceit going diagonally from corner to corner. Thibault states, the mountains came from some actual experience or place some time back in my life, from Arizona where I was born, from my time growing up in Utah and Southern California, or from my later life in Northern California. These places are the main sources of the memory material I worked with." Unquote. This is not the Yosemite I know and love, but it is evocative nonetheless, with its red magma glow and its thin band of vegetation slipping down the face. It's interesting to note that unlike most of Thibault's paintings, he worked and reworked many of these memory mountains over an extended period of years. It seems that he was never quite satisfied with them. I particularly like the many ambiguities of this fascinating piece. Is the tiny glowing red cow teetering on the edge of a small oval reservoir, or a radioactive glowing white hole in the ground? Is that a river on the left edge which peters to nothing? How can that path zigzag up the vertical cliff to the oversized cottage? How can the ridge line in the distance create a shadow on the ridge in front? Thibault is having fun with our perceptions, combining humor with anxiety. As art historian Margareta Lovell phrases it, understanding the Earth's crust as a fragile, paper-thin, hospitable space for flora, fauna, and human habitation, a precarious Eden sandwich between the transparent dome of air and the fathomless chartless, incomprehensible rock substrate is one of the things that makes Thibault's mountain landscapes bizarrely original and eerily unsettling." Unquote. The vignette of the state at the top is at once whimsical and yet frightening, as we can see the path on the left edge slipping into the abyss and the tree next to it falling away. In 2010, Thibault's son Paul, who had been managing a San Francisco gallery dedicated to his father's work, died tragically at age 50. This dramatic diagonal painting, which is with its hot halation contrasting with the whiteness finished that year, is the only one of Thibault's paintings that I know of which, of which depicts snow, and it may well have indicated Thibault's mood at the time. How horrible it is to outlive your offspring. Not all of Thibault's memory mountains are dark. This one has the same monumental bluffs with a hint of minuscule landscape growing at the top. But the rainbow of colors are now bright and sunny. Again, he indicates that he has worked on this canvas over many years. And yet, this detail shows lots of paint which has been applied wet on wet with many beautiful happy accidents. When Thibault was 12 and living in Long Beach, he and his friends eagerly awaited the annual arrival of the Ringing Brothers Circus. They would try to get circus jobs and free tickets. This most recent series has definite nostalgic overtones. Commenting about these paintings, Thibault says, contrasts and extremes, ominous clowns as very nasty fellows who are at once humans and phantoms. 
unquote. He jokes that if he'd had another profession, he would have liked to have been a clown. Humor has been part of Thibault's work for 80 years. With his cartooning background, and he has with his cartooning background, and he has even submitted captions to the New Yorker's back page of cartoons. He likes to make people smile, but the clowns are definitely bittersweet. As art critic Julia Friedman put it, he is, revised, he is revisiting childhood memories with a hindsight of adult wisdom, with palpable vacillation between joy and fear." Unquote. This diminutive, hunkered-down clown seems intimidated by his moment in the spotlight. The plain white background is buttered on afterwards, just as Thibaut did in his early still lives. Note that the clown's red nose is in the center of the composition, and the three buttons are imitating that nose. My friend Charles de Murray, the art critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, put it so nicely. A successful clown is a figure shocking in his knowledge of our silliest, most intimate selves, as menacing as the unguarded expression of our emotional instabilities." Unquote. The year Thibault painted this sad clown, 2015, was the year that his beloved wife, Betty Jean, died. They had been together for 55 years. This evocative piece reminds me of my flying dreams, when all I had to do was just lean forward and magically will myself to be airborne. After the monumental majesty of the Memory Mountains, this series seems a bit out of place. Again, as de Murray phrases it, this one may be a metaphor of the fool taken down by a tire that seems less threatening than overeager, the celebrated artist pinned down by an adoring fan." Unquote. Although this tiger has the look of a gentle cat, it does remind me, of, of, um, remind me as a child at the circus of that frightening thought that at any moment a giant tiger could overwhelm his trainer. Let's briefly review Thibaut's wide range of motifs. We have seen his abstract representational treatment of still lives, forcing us to look at everyday objects, and his early detached figure studies and the anxiety of his vertiginous street scenes, and his colorfully unsettling delta scenes glowing with inner light, and his monumentally moody memory mountains, and finally the poignant humor of his nostalgic clowns. The New Yorker cover is a new luscious ice cream with super rich colors buttered on and fascinating textures. It is similar yet different from his earliest paintings. It has a beautiful, vibrant, dark blue background and a milk chocolate surface instead of white. The tiny cherry reminds us of a clown's nose from his recent clown series. I'm told that Thibault does not know how many paintings he has finished. I'm shown, I have shown you a very subjective, tiny fraction of what surely must be thousands of paintings which this prolific, industrious, and thoughtful artist has produced over the last 60 years. Anyone who has met this generous, humble, seemingly immortal artist and teacher immediately likes him. He is surely the artist's artist. One of my artist friends with us was a student of his, and she said, it was one of the greatest privileges of my artistic life. As a teacher, he was endlessly informative about the history of art as well as an engaged and kind critic of one's work." Unquote. Thibault said, How audacious of me to pick up a brush when Velasquez did what he did. He continues, The wonderful thing about being a painter is having the privilege of coming into some sort of intimate contact with a great tradition, learning by mistakes, modifying, reconstituting, reorganizing over and over again. For me, painting is a joy, my own little Eden, but also the most difficult thing I've ever done." Unquote. As curator John Copeland says, Thibault owes no allegiance to any particular style. His painting is a product of a sturdily independent mind, and he has over the years indefatigably pursued a uniquely personal pathway." Unquote. This stanza from the great T.S. Eliot seems particularly appropriate for Wayne Thibault. We shall not cease from exploration, and at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive 
where we started and to know the place for the first time. Happy birthday, Wayne. I was talking with my sister recently, and she strongly urged me to show you two of my own Delta series to compare with Tebow's. I too rented a helicopter and was inspired by the beauty of the shadows, reflections, the patterns of the fields, the shape of the waterways. I have painted it just as I saw it. With his extraordinary imagination and inventiveness, Tebow takes the Delta to a whole different level. In this one, I have was fascinated by interplay of tree shadows in the early morning reflections, the patterns of the rich chocolate earth, and the swell of the blue river as it presses up against the, the levees. Like so many of Tebow's, I show no horizon. Thank you.